go, sir. It's all you. All right. You guys can see my slides uh, online. You guys can see them. Cool. Yep. Um, cool. Well, I'm. Uh, well, today we're going to be talking about parsing, and uh, I'm going to do an intro of myself and stuff in just a sec. But um, while I'm talking about this whole thing, um, from what I, from what it sounds like, most of the people on the call and, and in the room, you're you're mostly database administrators. Um, I know Cody writes code. Um, anyone else write code on a day to day basis? You got one. Anyone online? I do as well. Okay. No, I used to do awesome. a ton. Now I mainly tune. Okay. Good. Because we're going to talk about kind of some code concepts, but how it applies to databases. And at the end, um, I've been writing a, a, a project um, that's, that it is parsing SQL and it's going to analyze SQL and stuff. So while I'm talking, I want you to kind of be thinking about like, how would a tool like this help me and, you know, help you in your day-to-day -day, um, work, especially with Postgres? Because at the end, I want to have a, a conversation around, um, around this because um, the project is kind of in the middle stage. Um, a lot of it's done, but there's a lot more to go. And I'd like to get some of your feedback to see, like, what, what would you like to see from, from this? Because, um, you know, it's, it's going to be for, the, for everyone to be able to, to use in an open source way. So... Um, awesome. So um, I'm Brian Broderick. Um, I've been writing code for since uh, '99, so for a while. Um, currently, a principal data engineer at Entrada, which means that my day to day is is trying to wrangle a lot of engineers and help them uh, write better SQL and optimize. Um, you know, help optimize their databases. Help understand like how their schemas are built and, uh, you know, try and, try and fix that in, in as much as I can, right? So there's, there's a lot of people out there writing SQL. Um, some are writing better than others, and I'm trying to help the, the group um, collectively make that better. Um, I enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy gardening. Um, my backyard, I've been uh, kind of just building, a, a, like in Britain, they would call it like a, a, a cottage garden. So it's like, there's no grass, there's just stuff everywhere, which is kind of my sanctuary in the summer. And then lately my wife and I, we've been doing a pottery class, which has been more fun than I, I anticipated. And I actually really enjoy it now. So, um, but throughout my entire career, um, probably the biggest driving force for me is this, I have a thirst for understanding. And one of those things, one of my personal goals is I want to be able to write a database from scratch. And so I've been trying to learn like how they work. And so uh, talking about parsers and these kinds of things, like this is a big part of, of a database. And so I've been studying that and, and hopefully some of that knowledge will um, help you guys as well. So uh, feel free to uh, link to me on, on LinkedIn and um, link to me on GitHub or whatever, if, if you'd like. So cool. Um, so, Usually when you're dealing with some, some, uh, some text and some things, usually you're gonna start with regular expressions and substrings, right? Um, this works really well for simple patterns. You know, maybe you need to validate an email or, or whatever, but you can't really assign any meaning to text. And um, regular expressions are kind of slow. Um, I, I had a project recently where I had to do a lot of regular expressions uh, in the tune of millions, and it was taking minutes to run all these. And I converted it to a different pattern, and it became 327 times faster. So regular expressions are a good place to start, um, and, and this is where we often start. But eventually, um, we run into a, a situation where it's just not good enough for what we need, right? Um, so when reg regex isn't enough, it's it's time to start talking about parsers, right? Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about parsers. Like I said, uh, we're going to talk about a specific one at the end. But if you think about them, like we we do we we use a parser every single day, every single time we uh, we load a web page, it's doing an HTML parser, CSS. All these different things, every single program language has to run a parser because it has to take a bunch of text and make sense of it and then do stuff with it, right? Um, you have program language, you have SQL, GraphQL, JSON, whatever. 
Um, and he also had linters and formatters. So if you're ever uh, using any of those, like it's, it has to parse that, that code and then it, it rewrites it. And my project is, is um, the closest that you could say is it's, a, it's, it's probably like a SQL linter um, that we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. So, um, and by the way, feel free to interrupt or ask questions as we go. Um, happy, to, happy to answer any questions. Uh, we'll give time throughout, but um, just feel free to jump in. Cool. So let's talk about um, the first component of a, a, of a parser, and, and that's, a, that's called a lexer. It's um, basically what, what you can think of it is it's kind of like Pac-Man. It's just a thing that's just chomping bits as it goes, right? It's looking at every single letter in a, in a set of text, and it's trying to make sense of it, right? It's scanning all that text, and it looks for patterns and it takes those patterns and it turns them into to what they call tokens. And on the screen here is really, uh, it's a really compact version of, of tokens. Um, in my project, there's a few hundred different ones, um, but you can see things like, you know, there's a, an integer and a float and a string and there's like the equal sign and, you know, there's all these different things. And so the way the, uh, the lexer, the scanner works is it just, it, it, you know, it looks at that next, um, the next letter or the next number or the next symbol and it tries to match it. So if it finds a letter, it keeps going until it finds something that's not a letter. And if it's that, then it says, okay, you're an, you're an, an identity, right? Because an identity could be like a variable or a function name or any of those kinds of things. Um, if, it's, if it finds like an equal sign, it's like, okay, you're an equal sign. You're, or I'm gonna call you an assigned token and then I'm gonna keep going, right? So it just builds this whole tree, this whole list of, uh, of these tokens, right? So that's the first step in, in this process. Does anyone have any questions or? So do you write these lectures yourself or is this something that you inherit from the library? You can, I wrote mine myself. In fact, um, so this book, I'll, at the end I'll, I have screenshots of, of, book, of books and stuff, but this book is where I learned most of it. This is called Writing an Interpreter in Go. Um, so if you, want to learn more about it, it's a really good place to start. But in my case, I wrote it from scratch because I wanted to know how it works. Um, if you're writing something like C, C has a whole, like there's a bunch of libraries and stuff that kind of do this stuff for you, but you don't, you're not learning how it's doing it, right? And I wanted to learn how, how it's done. So, but in, in my case, I'm, I, it, there's no library, I'm writing from scratch. It's actually quite simple. Um, it just, it just pattern matching and it says like, okay, if you're an equal sign, there's just a big like uh, switch in there that says, okay, you're an equal sign, you're in a science, right? And it, it looks at um, the current place and then it looks at the next one. They, it, they call that peak, uh, peaking, right? It peaks to the next one. Cause you have things like, you know, in, in programming language, you'll, you'll have an equal sign, but then you'll have two equal signs and two equal signs is, an, is you know, it's, is it equal to something versus you're assigning it? So it has to look at that next character and sometimes two characters out. But um, as it's doing that, you know, just scanning it, finds it, checks it into a list and, and it, it's done in the end, right? Any other questions on lexers? I know Cody's written some, so, you know, if I'm missing stuff, you can, you can add to it. Um, all right, so the next step in this process is a parser. And the parser takes all those tokens and it converts it to an abstract syntax tree. And we'll get into what that means in a second, but all it's really doing is it, it finds a token. So maybe the token is, uh, um, well, act yeah. actually we'll, uh, we'll go on to the next slide and I'll give you an example. So, um, you know, find, in this case, you know, maybe we're doing JavaScript and it finds a token that's the token let, right? And then it has X, which would be an identity, then the equal sign, which is uh, converts it to a signs, and then the number one, right? So there's this set, this set of tokens. Then it, so it, it, it starts out with the first one and it just has um, a, a switch statement that says like, okay, 
you are a let token, and then it just says um, logic after that, right? So it knows like how to how to what what's it's expecting next. Um, so when we're talking about parsers, um, there's basically two two main kinds of things that you have to worry about, and that's the statements versus expressions. So a statement is um, is the whole thing. It's it's a in this case it's a let statement, right? When we're talking SQL. There's select statements and there's insert statements and update statements. That's kind of like a container for that for that command, right? So that's the statement part of it. And then the expression is what it's actually doing. So the difference between the two is the fact that um, a statement is kind of like a container and then the expression actually returns something, right? And so it's just kind of building out this whole thing. So we have a let statement and then the expression happens to be x equals one which ultimately, once it's finally done, it actually sets the value x to equal one, right? Or, you know, there might be a return statement and you're returning the value of x, which would, it would return the value of one, right? Does that make sense? So, may, may I interject a little bit here? What's that? May I interject for a second? Yes, please. Confused, confused by it. Uh, yes. The way I like to think about statements versus expression is a statement is you have a bunch of blocks on a table and you're wiggling them around doing stuff. You're changing things. But when you're talking about expressions, you're not, I mean, you're inherently changing things. It's still a computer, right? But the way you're thinking about it changes. Instead, you're taking in building blocks, you're assembling, and you're handing it back. So in, a, in something like Golang, Golang assignments are a statement, right? Am I wrong there? Uh, uh, the assignment portion or the um, uh, assignment in general, like x equals one. Uh, yeah, that would be an expression. Then it's an expression. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in C, though, I think it's a state, right? So Golang and Ruby and Elixir, the equals itself returns the value that was assigned to the variable. Yeah. Right. So instead of trying to shift bits in memory, we're still shifting bits of memory under the hood, but we're thinking about it as assembling the piece and handing it up. Yeah. Yeah, the, so what you're talking about building, it would actually, there would be a statement in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. That they actually, oh, well, in, in the book, it calls it an expression statement because you have to have this, this container, right? Yeah. Um, so in our case, we have let it, x equals one. If you took let off, it would still work, right? You could say x equals one, but there's this invisible statement that's, that's they just call it an expression statement. Um, and then x equals one is the actual expression that's going to then actually do and return something, right? Cool. Um, so yeah, so oh, by the way, I, I was having fun with the uh, uh, image generation from uh, Adobe. That, um, so all these like different screens, I tried to uh, make it sort of look like the thing. So uh, we have our, uh, our statement there on the left. He's kind of like just not really doing a whole lot. And then we have the expression on the right there. So um, cool. So let's talk about there's um, the, the part that's more interesting is the expressions part, because that's what's actually like doing stuff um, versus just kind of the command that I need to do. So there's three main types of expressions. There's a prefix, infix, and postfix. The, the whole difference here, if we look at the picture, you have a left side of something, you have the operator, and then you have a right side of something. So a prefix doesn't have anything on the left. The operator is that minus sign to make, to make it negative. And then the right is the one, right? So in a prefix, you'd have a, a null on left, operator negative, or a, a minus, right is a one. Infix has all three, so we've got x on the left equals as the operator, uh, right is one. And then postfix doesn't have uh, anything on the left, and then it has the, the um, operator happens to actually be the plus plus part, and then the right is the, or sorry, I, I, I got that back. The left is the i, the operator is the plus plus thing, and then the right is null. So sorry, I mixed that up a little bit, but so, so they're all like that, right? And they're all basically um, everything in there is just these little tree, these little like nodes with a left and operator and right. And it can get really complicated, right? In this case, on the right is actually another expression. The one times nine is an expression, it happens to be on the right side of that plus. Um, 
And it's all based on, on precedence here. Um, so if you remember back to math, you know, you, you multiply before you add and so on, right? Um, if we're thinking about things like a SQL statement, the and is gonna happen after, you know, if you say like one plus one and, you know, two times two, and is gonna happen after. You have to, you have to evaluate both sides first and then you do the and. So there's this whole precedence um, that, that they have. And in my case, I think I've got maybe like 20 or so different things in there. But it just like, it looks at each one of those things and says, okay, if I found a plus, um, you know, I'm gonna keep going. So, so in this case, I take the X equals two plus one times nine and one times nine becomes an expression, the two plus, um, and then the result of one times nine becomes another expression and so on, right? So ultimately when you're all done, it sets X equal to 11. So each one of these things, it kind of builds out this whole tree of stuff, right? If you think of like a SQL statement that's doing a lot of things, or if you're thinking about a program, this is gonna get pretty huge, right? And, when, and that pretty huge thing is, this is your abstract syntax tree. So you're taking one little node and now you have maybe hundreds or whatever, right? Depending on how complex. And so a program is gonna have many statements and each statement is gonna have many expressions, right? Does that make sense? So once you have this tree, you can start to do stuff with it, right? And, and what you do with it is what um, really determines what your project is. Like if you need to evaluate it, maybe you're an interpreted language or, or if you compile it, now you're compiling language, right? So the difference is like, if, I, if all I'm doing is I'm walking the tree and I'm figuring out, you know, if we go back here, if I'm walking the tree and, and I just immediately, I'd see one times nine and I return nine, and I'm just doing it as I'm going, that's what uh, interpreted languages do. Um, and most languages, at least the ones that I've used, um, most languages start out in this place where they're just, they're walking this tree and they're returning it. That's how Ruby was in the beginning, uh, PHP in the beginning. Like eventually, you know, people start to say like, well, it's too slow. And so they, they'll they uh, start to think about like how to compile it, which is to take it and and um, instead of just walking this tree, it converts it into another whole step to make it faster, you know? So Go is gonna compile it. So now it's in a, uh, it doesn't have to like walk through all that code anymore. Now it's just a list of, of different commands that it needs to do, but it's done at once. And then every time you run it afterwards, uh, you don't have to go through that whole first step, right? So it becomes faster. Um, SQL and, and stuff like that. Um, it, it could be both. So you're normal, you know, you know, you just run a SQL statement. It's gonna be a, an evaluation of that. Um, but if you're thinking about like uh, prepared statements, that's a, that's a compiled version of that um, because it only has to do it one time. And then in theory, you should be able to hit that same prepared statement over and over and over again, right? Haven't really seen that done a lot in practice. Um, even ORMs that try and do that, don't really do it right. Um, but you know, for the most part, you write select, you know, star from users or whatever, it's gonna be an evaluation of that. Um, does that make sense? Uh, everyone online, does that make sense to you guys? I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take silence as either you're all gone or you're, you're totally on board. Okay, I got a thumbs up, cool. Why not? <laughs> Why not both? Um, all right, so we've got a tree of stuff, right? Um, which is pretty cool. So, so what, once we have this, now it's, like I said, it's what do we wanna do with this thing? And if we go back to the beginning where, you know, it could be interpreted language, it could be, I'm running a query against a database, it could be a linter, formatter, whatever. Um, like the next piece is, is, is really important. In my particular case, I wanted to understand um, in aggregate what all of my queries are actually doing. Um, like I said, I, um, you know, we have hundreds of engineers here. My last show, we had hundreds of engineers. They're all writing queries, some better, some worse. But what are they actually doing? There's way too many for me personally to keep track of all of it without, without some sort of tool, right? So about eight or so years ago, I started writing this tool. It's, it's had a few renames over the time. It's had a few revisions. Um, this version of it is... Um, 
taking all those queries, it, uh, it, um, it takes the parameters out of the query. So like select star from users or ID equals 42. 42 turns into a question mark. So now I have that same shape of query and it doesn't matter if it's 42 or 45 or 47, it's still the same query, right? I do that by when I'm going through that abstract tree, um, I look for anything that's a, a string or an integer and I just convert it to a, a, a question mark, right? If you're thinking prepared statements, I could have done dollar sign one, dollar sign two, whatever. Um, in my case, the question mark made more sense because I'm trying to, to squash things down into the same query. And if you think about things like a um, like in in a where statement, you know, where ID in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, it doesn't matter if there's if there's three elements in there or 500, it's still the same query. So I take all that and I squash it down into one question mark, right? When I was doing the dollar sign one to keep it all um, in order, uh, and then I squashed it. It made my thing in weird orders because if I had four elements in that, and I went and did something in the next one, it was it was showing dollar sign five, so it just didn't look like the same query anymore. So I I I just made a question mark because doesn't really matter. Um, so so in my case, so I'm doing that, and then once I know like okay, here are all my queries. Uh, I can count them really easily. I can look at how long do they take, you know, pulling from like PG logs or whatever. I can say, okay, this query took a second. It ran a thousand times. Over those thousand times, total, it took maybe, you know, a thousand seconds or whatever. I can start to count up those things and I can see what what's the queries are the most impactful um, as far as uh, my entire server. Now there are tools out there. You're probably already thinking, hey, I know there's tools out there. There's PG Badger. There's some others that, that basically do this. Um, I had a tool at, at my last job um, that did this, that, that uh, took all this data and I put it into Elasticsearch so we could do real-time graphs um, on how these queries are being run. Um, we'd push code, we'd see it spike or drop or whatever. And that was great. Um, but I always wanted to go just one step further. And so this version of this app is going one step further. Um, the previous version, I was using someone else's parser library. I was actually using Postgres's actual parser library, but trying to walk their tree was, was really complicated. And I wanted to learn it myself, so I, I, I wrote it. Um, but because now I, I can control that tree, I can start to see things like what actual columns are being selected what actual tables are being selected, right? Because, you know, you may have a database that has 2,000 tables. It's been sitting there for 15 years with, you know, hundreds of engineers. You don't know which tables are still actually being used. Maybe it's been some, some you know, some project that was obsolete 10 years ago and it has like, you know, 50 gigs of data, but no one actually ever touches it and no one knows this, right? So this is, you know, I'm able to say like, Okay, these are the tables that are actually being used. These are how I'm actually joining them together. Um, you know, what, what columns are in my where clauses? What columns are in my group by clauses? Because those kinds of things can inform me. Um, you know, if I have a table that, uh, um, you know, it always has one specific column that's in the where clause, no matter what, maybe I should do something about that. Maybe that's a partial index, or maybe that's a, a sign that I should split that table, right? For example, let's say there's always a, a deleted app, or you know, and I'm always saying where where deleted app is null, right? And maybe instead of doing that, maybe I actually split it and I put my deleteds in a different table and I leave my non-deleteds in a table, or I do a partial index on that specific field. It just allows me to kind of um, optimize things a little bit better, right? Because now I, I'm starting to understand what my true access patterns are of this database. Um, and so, so that's what the goal is of this project of Lantern. Um, and uh, like I said, it's open source. I'll, I have a link in just a sec. Um, this was the previous version of it, where it was all going to Elasticsearch. And it may go again. I'm still debating on whether to uh, put it in Postgres or put it back in Elasticsearch. At the moment, I'm... I'm uh, uh, putting in Postgres is because it's a little bit easier to to do ad hoc at, uh, analysis on stuff. But um, I may do that and then also do it in Elastic. I don't know. Um, love your guys' feedback to see like 
you know, where, where would you see this kind of going? Uh, where would be more, more beneficial? But these two things, so the top one was the total count, right? Uh, the bottom was the total duration. These, these are kibonographs. Um, so you could click on them, you could drill in, you could see like, okay, here's this query, you know, this first one here that was run 150,000 times. What is it? And, and get more information, right? Um, the current version doesn't have this yet. Again, it's, it's still work in progress. Um, so this, the, the black one here, that's the book that I'm reading currently, the Writing and Interpreter in Go. Um, started reading the Writing and Compiler. Um, these other ones on the screen are other um, resources out there. Crafting Interpreters uh, is written by a guy that's, uh, he's writing the Dart language for, for uh, Google. Um, and he's written a whole book on how to write interpreters. And then the Ren, it, Ren.io is a, a, a small programming language. It's supposed to be a, meant to be an embeddable um, and they've commented really well. So like, just like, and, and it's really small. I think, I think they say it's like 4,000 semicolons is the way he, he described it, right? So it's something that you could, you could, you know, potentially read through. Um, it's supposed to be really well commented. I'm gonna look at that one a little bit more closely um, for, a, for a future project. But yeah, if you wanna look into this further, um, the, uh, the black book there is a, is a great place to start. I believe it's interpreter, uh, let's see, I think I actually wrote down the interpreterbook.com or you can just Google Thorson Ball and, uh, and it'll come up. So, um, cool. So, yeah, so I'm gonna pause here. Um, we went through a lot just now. Do you guys have any questions or thoughts uh, before I, I show you Lantern uh, a little bit in action? I suggest Elasticsearch. You, you want Elasticsearch for it? Yeah, because I like. It. Yeah, it was it was nice. It it really so we we used it uh, um, at a place called Podium, and it really informed how to how and where to focus our efforts on on where to optimize stuff. Right. So it was, uh, uh, yeah, it it was something that we used almost every day, really. There, so. Um, yeah, that's what you're Yeah, uh, lan Lantern and both. Yeah, in, in that version, so we were running our Postgres on EC2. We weren't doing um, RDS, uh, at least for our main databases. And when you run your own Postgres, you can install your own extensions. And one of the extensions was, it was called Redis Log. And so it took the logs, it put it in JSON, pushed it onto Redis, and so that version of this program, uh, it uh, pulled off a Redis, um, did all the all the aggregation stuff, and then put it on Elasticsearch. That was the whole thing, right? Um, you know, that that's awesome when you run your own, but no one wants to run their own databases anymore. Um, so this version, when when it's ready, it will uh, pull from uh, the log files off of S3. And then it'll it'll parse through the log files, and then it'll basically do the same thing. But it, it'll it'll do the counts, and then it'll take it one step further. So you can eventually, I'd like to see like um, you know maybe it's in Kibana, or you know if it's in Elasticsearch, it'll be in Kibana. But if not, I might do some JavaScript stuff to uh, create some some graphs around like how how are the uh, tables actually being joined together? You know start to look at like clustering, uh, you know, nearest neighbor. There's all kinds of fun stuff that we can do once we have the data, right? So, um, but yeah, we, we might we might end up back in Elasticsearch, which is great. I love that database. So um, the second link down is, uh, is where this project is. It's Brian Broderick slash Lantern over at GitHub. So feel free to check it out. Um, cool. Any other questions, thoughts? User quiet. Either I'm I'm killing it, or you guys are completely bored, or <laughs> so you're killing it. I'm actually reading right now. Oh, okay, you're, you're killing it. You're Sweet. <laughs> um, I'm not a computer scientist. It's out of my league, but I am impressed, and thank you for taking the time to present this. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you Lantern real quick. Um, you can kind of get a, a taste of it. So. 
Um, I think I need to stop sharing just for a second. So, because I was just, I need to show you my command line. So one sec here, we're gonna share again. All right. Okay, so here, let me get out of it. I was in it already. Um, so Lantern, it's a Go project. Um, you, uh, if you have Go and everything installed, you can, you can install it. Eventually I'll just have the executable or whatever, but for now it's, it's uh, um, it, let me actually show you. If, if you do uh, download it, you wanna play with this. Um, so here's the folder that I'm in. Um, and um, I got faces in the way, I'm gonna move you guys out of the way. Um, so it, in this project, in the CMD, the command folder, there's a lantern, that's where main is for, for go. So that's kind of the starting point. You would just go build that, and then you'd run lantern. This is just a, um, a console version of it. Um, so, once I'm in here, I can do something like, uh, we'll do select ID from users, you know, whatever your query happens to be. So um, this is where I've shown you that it rewrites the query. Um, let's do one that's just a slightly more complicated and I'll show you a couple more that's a little bit more complicated than that. So we'll do select ID from users, ID equals my favorite number 42. And so you can see like, this is where it, it changed it to a question mark. So that's how it sees the shape of this query. You can see that it's selecting the ID column. It's pulling out the table of users in this case. Um, and see, I, I, was, I was doing where right before. Um, so I don't know why it's not here. Let me, let me try one that's just a little bit different. I was doing, I was doing where right before this, this uh, this demo. So I'll say name equals Brian. Because I think it's just getting hung up on the fact that ID is in there. Yeah, so name is right here. Um, so so you can see that. Let, let me uh, let me show you just a couple more real quick. Um, they're a little bit more complicated. By the way, while I'm while I'm finding this, um, I'm gonna plug writing unit tests real quick. I'm always on on this uh, uh, bandwagon of you guys. Should, if you're writing code, you need to write some unit tests. There's absolutely no way that I would have been able to write this project without writing extensive unit tests because there's just way too many things you can do with this with the language. Like these are all different queries that it had to work with. And then when I made it work with something else, sometimes it broke some of the previous ones. And so just having these in play was the only way that this thing could have ever worked. So um, Pat's probably sick of me carving on. Does the test uh, just check that it doesn't blow up or are you also specifying what should be returned? Just what should be returned, yeah. So I'm gonna do this query here, it's slightly, more complicated, it's got some joins. Um, in this case, it's joining um, the addresses to the customers, addresses to states, and then customers to phone numbers. Um, if you look in the query itself, I've got join addresses. Um, I'm joining addresses, or sorry, I'm joining customers to addresses, and then I'm joining addresses to states, and then, and then finally I'm joining phone numbers, but I'm using, I'm joining phone numbers back to customers, right? So it's not just looking at it in order. You'd never be able to do this with a regular expression. It has to look at the last thing and say, you know what? It matches um, one of the one of the first things. And I'm doing that based on the on the on clause. So I've got phone number here, I've got customer here, and so it knows because I'm I'm matching those two together that it's actually joining those two tables and uh, and and knows how to extract that. Also, one of, one of my personal pet peeves, and um, this is something I wanted to build into this, when you're trying to optimize a query that someone else wrote, and it's like a 400 line query, and there's aliases everywhere, and there's subselects, and there's all this crap going on, it's really hard to know that C.ID is 
something, right? So I, I uh, did a thing I call the resolver. And so in here, you can see it's actually customer's ID where it was CID. It went and figured all that out and, and took the aliases and put the right tables in there. Just so when I'm looking at it and I'm trying to optimize the thing, I can go, okay, I actually know what the heck's going on here. I don't have to spend an hour trying to like do this on my own, right? So you do it self -care. I haven't tried that yet. I should try that. Um, that would, what would that do? That would probably, yeah, that's a good question. That would probably break, to be honest. Test. <laughs> Another unit test. Yes. Yes. Well, wouldn't it just say that on joins? It would say address to address, really. Yeah, it would, it would probably, it would, yeah. It would, it would, address to address. It, I don't know if it would break per se, but it wouldn't give you what you're expecting. Yeah. Yeah. Probably um, resolve them both the aliases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point too. Maybe it would only show one join because it wouldn't know that there's actually two of them. You would think one. Yeah, it's trying to duplicate. You know, a total tangent on this. I'm going through and trying to rewrite Postgres's query language. There's so many things that I'm like, oh, I didn't even know Postgres could do that. You know, there's like probably probably 15 things. I'm like, wow. And I wish it didn't, because it makes it really complicated, you know, like. Um, In chat, Jessica just mentioned that that's a pet peeve of hers, too, and that she thinks this part, this uh, part of it is awesome. Okay. Is Which is the pet peeve, having C.ID on everything? Yeah. yeah. I, so I intend eventually to have, um, have all this on a website, so you can just throw in your SQL, and have it just format a pretty, unalias everything, just so you can, like, you know, make sense of a query, right? Or maybe you have an API at some point or whatever. And so just kind of make it a little bit more usable um, without having to, you know, install Go and all that stuff, right? So um, yeah, anyway, um, this is why I want you guys to like, you know, give me feedback and say, what would you like to see, you know, with something like this in the future? But I, 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 it's a lot and speaking about the, uh, lots of different ways to do it. I, I learned more than this year, but I've been, Focus for five years to pick a server for many years it's been around. <laughs> but um, yeah, the update statement apparently you can say update and put parens and put the column name, then the equal, and then parens. Yeah, within the parens, a select statement, and it just does the assignment kind of like structuring, restructuring. Yeah, and I was like, wow, but I didn't know about that. I didn't either, and I had to write so I because. We have, you know, I'm, I'm using a, a test set of about 2 million queries. It turns out to be about 6,500 unique queries, mm -hmm. but there's all these weird little things in there. I'm like, wow, I didn't know I could do that. And then I had to write, I had to like change my code to go, okay, now it needs to be able to actually handle that, right? So, um, but yeah, that's one of the cases that it, it can handle now. So it's, it's that pairing of things. Um, so with that in mind, so this is basically it. Um, I want to turn it over to you guys for a few minutes and just, Tell me, like, if you had a tool like this, how would you want to use it? Like, what could you get out of this thing that, that I haven't already talked about? Or what are the things that I have talked about that are like, yeah, we need to do that for sure, right? So the big one for me, uh, we have a rule in the way that we draw service boundaries for our backend, where if two tables have to be updated in the same request, they must be in the same database and therefore must be in the same service. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm splitting apart some of our largest services, what I would really like to know is which tables are updated in the same transaction. Okay. Yeah. Because then I can start splitting that up really. Yeah. Well, and to add on to that, what Cody's saying too is that from our side on the DBAs and everything else, we always get queries, but we always get customers. Our customers are engineers. And engineers come to us and say, well, who else is accessing this table? I have no idea. But with this, and we did this at Podium and other places too, Lantern, we can literally say search for the table and it finds every query that's related to that table because it's right there in the list. You can find every query that hits the customer table in some way, shape, or form very quickly because you have it all stored there. Yeah, all this is going to be in a nice relational, at least version, you know, one version of this is going to be nice relational Postgres. So you can say, yes, I have a user table. What else is touching that? What queries are touching the user table? I can just quickly write a, a, a query for that. So the columns add on even more that you can say, well, who's using my name column mm -hmm. in all of these databases and things like that? And you get the time and then because they're searchable. I was really useful. You mentioned earlier um, making 
decisions by neighboring facilities table. Well, if you're going to split that table, how many downstream? Yeah, how many people are going to have to Yeah, it's helpful to know that. Yeah. Um, I think, did you start having your hand up? Yes. Uh, it, it was actually a question, so I'm shift, not changing the subject, but also not giving you examples. Okay. okay. Uh, is the code for this structure, it's a, there's, it sounds like there's three parts to this. The first is getting the logs, the query logs. The second is parsing and analyzing the query logs. And the third is putting them somewhere. So ETL kind of stuff, right? Is it written such that the trans I could provide my own extraction and loading part and make use of the transformation part here? Or is it very tightly coupled to the Redis and Elasticsearch flow? Um, it is not coupled to anything. So um, one of the things that I really like about the Go um, world is they don't try and think for you for everything. Like, like you, you know, if you're in Ruby land, you're doing Rails, you're doing it the Rails way. If you're doing Elixir, maybe you're doing Phoenix, you're doing a lot of the Phoenix way, right? Maybe you can, you can branch out, but you know, you're, you're kind of in this framework, right? In Go, they don't have, there's no one framework. They're just a bunch of libraries. You're like, oh, I want a router and I want to do this. I want, you know, I'm going to pull all these pieces together. So these are all very modular. If I, if I click over to here, um, I'm going to show you. So in Go, um, they have, they have kind of two, two uh, things. They have an internal folder, which is meant for stuff that's internal to this app. Then they have packages. That are meant for you know anyone can include this one package if they want right and inside of, of here so i have all of these are different packages so if you wanted just the say just the the uh the the token um you wanted just the lexer you could do just those pieces if you wanted and you could you could wrap everything now grant there may be stuff that i haven't i haven't thought about writing yet that you would you would need to you know you would need but um like if if that ever came up, like we should talk and I can help make sure that it's in the right format, you know? So back to use cases, uh, another one that I would use it for is uh, figuring out what things are we trying to calculate like, like at runtime when a request comes in versus what things should we start pre-computing um, for performance reasons uh, or this query is so freaking hairy. Can we take this these fifteen different sub queries, turn them into a pre-computed thing, and just pull the result? Yes. Um, so on those lines, um, so you've seen where I, I'm stripping out the parameters and I'm putting a question mark. Well, I still have those values. One of the things I want to be able to do is say, okay, value. Let's pretend you're column ID, right? You're probably going to have just a million different numbers, right? It's a high cardinality column, whatever. And but I should be able to, to look at all of those and actually tell you, yes, it's a high cardinality thing. There's, you know, out of the 10,000 queries that hit it, there's you know 8,000 different numbers or whatever. Like that's one thing. Another thing it might be like, you know, where uh, deleted out is null, and it's always that one thing, right? And I now I know. Or what if it's a what if it's a caching table? We, we have some of these here where we have a we have a cache table that's just a, kind of an aggregate of other tables. That cache table is just forever long, right? It's 10 years of, of stuff in there. Well, if we start to be able to look and say, okay, maybe there's some sort of date column, right? Um, you know, published date or whatever, I don't know what it is, but published date will say, what if the query is always saying, give me the last 30 days or give me the last seven days or give me the last six months, now, I, now that I can inform myself of that and say, you know what, I don't need 10 years of data in this cache table when I'm only ever looking at 30 days worth. Maybe I can get rid of that stuff. And if you want it older than 30 days, go to the original tables for that because that's not the point of this cache table. The cache table is now the last 30 days worth of stuff. Instead of a billion rows in this thing, now I have you know a million or something, right? So yeah, looking at like those different things and being able to make sense of, of that. Does that kind of jive a little bit with what, what you're thinking there? Yeah. So if you're talking about uh, the way that you store the arguments to the, to the query parameters, right? Um, what about regulated environments where there's very sensitive data? Um, is, is the library written in such a way that we could very much not store that? Like is that application code that we have to write with the glue or? 
uh, I guess when you're talking about the speed modular, I assume I could strip that stuff out. Or does that have to be in the law? That's a, I have thought about that. Um, there's a there's another project that I've done recently that anonymizes code um, and data. You could easily anonymize that. And you'd still, it wouldn't matter if it was 42 or 89, it's it's another number. And now, you know what I mean? Like, or text could become something. So yeah, it, you could do that in a safe way. Um, haven't, haven't thought through that yet, but I love that you brought that up because that like gives me a little light bulb to think about, so. So keep in mind, you would have it, because again, the source of this is Postgres log, so you would have it in there entire time. But you're right, you could have a segment saying, for the security purposes or whatever else, you could say, my logs are here. Once it comes into this program, that's where you'd have to be concerned with it, because then that program could save it or store it as well. But it'll always be in the log, however Postgres has it. And the way Postgres does it. Yeah. So like the way that you did it at Podium was you Redis log, so that data would be in Redis, Redis right? And so we would have to do something different so that it went somewhere with that. Path. Yeah, and you could, I, I can see a setting of like, don't actually store the data, just give me the results of the data, mm -hmm. right? If, if I know that I, you know, the ID column, just as a high cardinality, there's 8,000 different numbers for 10,000 different queries. Maybe that's all I really need for that. Um, and then maybe I could turn it on for like certain things and say, okay, but actually for, for the date range, I need to know the actual values for that, right? So I, I can see some settings there that... Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately the best way anytime you deal with this is that you need to just flag columns and stuff as sensitive or not. Something that flags it so you know, so that you have that turn on, turn off capability. You just simply say, don't do it to this column in the process, in the parser or anywhere else. Don't store it, just do it. Again, it's still in the log, but there's nothing to do about that. But then there, it's taken out. Mm -hmm. That gives you the most flexibility because we do that in other things too. When we're doing anonymization or anything else, we say what in the database is sensitive. That's what we have to worry about. Everything else, we don't care. We've got a status list of 100 different numbers. We don't care. They're right. not sensitive. So you've got social, that's a sensitive thing. Right. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one to think through. Um, the anonymizer would be interesting if you ran it against it because you would lose your pattern. The anonymizer doesn't maintain a pattern, so in that case, it actually does. It would, okay. So yeah, that could be an option if you use the anonymizer, then the pattern stays. You'd still have it. You would just have a pattern of something else. Yeah, you wouldn't know what ten is versus right the real nine or whatever. Right. Says. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to. You wouldn't be able to say that my date range is in the last thirty days because right. it'd be some other date, but it'd still be a date, you right? Would see so, a pattern. You yeah. Would see some pattern, but you wouldn't know what the pattern was. Yeah, yeah. that'd be tough. I don't know. If I for for text fields, I could see easily like just changing, yeah, you know, anonymizing the text fields and stuff. Yeah. Um, numbers would be a little harder. Numbers would be a little harder. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's a really good thing. That is a good point. Yeah. Um, another thing I've thought about is like I'm already able to parse the create statements, so I could easily parse the the uh, schema dump. We could get some analysis out of that. I know there's already ways to know, like if I'm missing a, an index, you know, you look at PG stats, you can already know, but kind of along those lines of like, okay, I'm, I'm running these queries, these are in my where clauses, is there actually a, you know, a, an index for that or not? Um, I don't know how useful, because like I said, you can get that from PG stats really easily just by looking at, a, at the table scan number. Um, if it's high, you're probably missing an index, so. Um, Well, I'm, I'm thinking it wouldn't be useful. It's the same query. Well, it's a different query plan. That's true. Run explain and then parse explain and start seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. I've got the same query, but I've got two different query plans. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it on a sample basis. Because there's too many. Well, okay. So I totally agree. Um, what, what I've done with this is it's actually a two-step thing. The first step is to figure out um, the unique query. So it's not doing any analysis at that point. Take two and a half million queries, turn it into 6,000 unique queries, right? And then I'm running analysis on those 6,000 queries because the you only need to run that one query one time to get that one explain plan, right? So you still don't necessarily want to run it against prod because it might you know, 
hit it a little harder, um, especially if you want to do like an analyze or something. But um, yeah, yeah, just <laughs> run those queries and then analyze the queries that I just ran. You know, um, cool. Well, that's all I've got. Um, feel free to you know ping me. If you have, if you run any questions, um, the Git, GitHub has the uh, issues and all that stuff. Feel free to just you know ping me on there or on Meetup or whatever. Um, happy to you know if if you ever wanted to actually use something like this, happy to sit down or do a Zoom or something. We can kind of just walk through stuff and um, yeah. So uh, work in progress. I'll uh, I'll let the group know when it's a little bit more. Um, in a in a consumable format. So cool. Okay. Thanks, Thanks guys. All right. And oh wait yeah, on. All right for everybody online, thank you for coming. Um so I will post this up on YouTube probably tomorrow. I usually get to them later tonight or something and I post them up there. Um I post the link back in the meetup so you'll see it there. But if you just find uh, Utah Geek Events on YouTube. You'll find our channel. You'll find all the ones that say PG US, you know, I mean, PG Utah. Um, and you can find the session there. And we're planning, uh, we're starting to look for a speaker for next month. We're open for our speakers, but also, most importantly, April 5th, come out to SQL Saturday. That's just next week. We want to see everybody there um, and come and enjoy yourself. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thanks for setting this up. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it.